Welcome to Globe Watch with me, Charles Ebune. Just take a look at the troubles across the world around you today, and you will come out with a clear, non scientific conclusion that the troubles of the world have exponentially increased without an increase drastically of resources to solve the problems. They range from conflicts in Syria to those in the Central African Republic and from Nigeria to Yemen. The entire world is undoubtedly sick. And one of the major fallout of such a situation is an increase of refugees in need of humanitarian assistance. Relief agencies across the world are struggling with limited resources to provide the best possible assistance they can give to those in need. The International Committee for the Red Cross is just one of them. Plus, 150 years have gone and the troubles remain the same, just like the founding missions of the organization suggest. So just how stressed are humanitarian agencies across the world and what is the Red Cross in particular doing to help solve the troubles of the world. My guest today is the president of the International Committee of the Red Cross. The president of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Peter Morrow, welcome to Globe Watch. Thank you very much for having me and for your interest in the work of ICRC. Uh, let me just give you statistics of your 2014 report. Over 26 million people had better access to portable water. You have about 9 million others who received basic assistance in terms of food. And you have million others who received assistance uh, when it comes to evacuation. 6.2 million others benefited from health care services. And over 8,000 others received visits. When you conclude with such statistics, do you have a feeling that you were successful? Well, let me first recognize uh, what you mentioned in your introduction. It is also our feeling that we have seen over the last three or four years a world with more conflict, deeper conflict, more regional conflict, with impact on civilian populations very huge and that we are continuously struggling behind a dramatically increasing landscape of needs. So as a humanitarian, you are never satisfied because needs are always bigger than what you are able to do. What I am satisfied and proud of is that we have at least been able to do what you just mentioned. And this has been hard work because it has been work which needs negotiations with party to the conflict to accept the services and work of the ICRC in some of the most difficult circumstances. It's not only the figures which are important, it's also where we have been able to deliver. And we have been able to deliver in places where no other organization is delivering humanitarian services. In rural Afghanistan, in Yemen, in the south of Somalia, in the north of Mali. You mentioned the Democratic Republic of the Congo in some of the rural area. In, with those displaced in South Sudan, which are not in camps, but just out in the landscape. So there is always a mixed picture. You are never satisfied because needs are bigger. And nevertheless, we are proud 
that we are able to do what we are doing. Uh, well, as somebody who is defending the International Committee for the Red Cross, you are probably proud of the work done. Um, you just said that you work in the most difficult places where other agencies cannot enter in very terrible circumstances. Can I have such difficult places with such difficult circumstances under which you work? Well, uh, we, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we work in many areas of Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan, in terms of staff, is the largest operation of ICRC with more than 1,500 staff working in all provinces of Afghanistan. We work in the south of Somalia, where, except for the Somali Red Crescent and ICRC, no other international actor is present. Uh, we work in the north of Mali, where most of the organization have withdrawn over the last couple of months, and the ICRC is responding substantively. And then, of course, let me be very honest, there are areas which are difficult and where we are not. But those are also areas where nobody is. Which like are some of those areas? Like some of those areas are some, for instance, in Islamic State group controlled territory of Syria and Iraq. Mm. We don't have any regular activity. We have from time to time the possibility to negotiate a delivery of medicine, a delivery of food, some water, but it's very punctual and not consistent. We are not uh, active in some of the areas controlled by Boko Haram because we don't have the ability to negotiate the humanitarian space in which the work of ICRC is respected for the time being. You, you, I go back to your agency statistics. Over 470,000 calls were made between prisoners and their close associates, can be family members. How do you go about succeeding in these extreme missions? Well, I think with regard to detention facilities, prisons that we visit, and you mentioned rightly so, the figure of 800,000 prisoners who got the visit of ICRC last year. In those circumstances, we base our work on what we have developed over the last decades. We are operating confidentially. We are visiting detention facilities building confidence with deten detention authorities and ministries of security who give us the possibility to work in those prisons and this allows us then to offer services to the prisoners that nobody else is offering. It allows us to connect them to their families and closed ones in any part of the world. We, uh, as you may know, we are visiting detainees in Guantanamo, which is one of the more famous prison facilities which we visit, and many of the families of Guantanamo detainees are either in Afghanistan or in Yemen, and we help those families to come to the ICRC delegation. We put uh, telecommunication cabins ready, and because we are entitled to be in Guantanamo and because we are entitled to be in Afghanistan this allows us to connect families and at least have some of the long distance communication between families and detainees. If you talk to the executive um, director of the United Nations food program, Etari Kozin, who happens to be guest on this program, she will tell you that you have about 280 million people suffering of hunger across the world when you talk to uh, 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 other humanitarian agencies across the world, they will tell you that at least 75 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance across the world. Do you think that the fundamental values, the fundamental principles, and the fundamental missions of the International Red Cross meet the challenges of 
current times. Again, none of the organizations that you mention, and we all do the same statistics and assessment, will meet the challenges with which we are confronted. We are always below what we would like to do, otherwise you are not in a credible humanitarian actor. Mm. Uh, it is very clear, and I share Evelyn Cousins and other colleagues' assessment, that at the present moment we have skyrocketing needs and we have human and financial resources which do not cope with those needs. So the difference between uh, the number of people who need humanitarian assistance and the capacity of organizations to cope is not satisfactory. I think we are here to narrow that gap. And that gap has, been, has to be narrowed by finding more and more generous donors. It has to find, uh, to be uh, coped with in having new financial instruments, new capacities, connecting better to local authorities and to local capacities. So there are many strategic orientations that ICRC and many others have taken in the past couple of months which increase our capacity. ICRC over the last three years has increased by 50% mm. its field operations. This mm. is a lot in three years. But of course it's too little in order to cope with the needs. We need more organizations we need more organizations active in places where uh, uh, nobody is active and, and therefore I share your view that more has to be done. Mr. President, we'll be concluding in a very short time from now. Your recent operations have been in Yemen. Uh, you know of the difficulties involved in that area. Today, uh, your planes uh, were the first to arrive after the escalation of violence between the Houthis and the government of President uh, Mansour Rabohadi. Just how exposed are your workers? I think two concerns are uh, first and foremost on my mind each and every morning. The first is the concern about the safety and security for our staff. And increasingly, our staff has been victim of insecure situations and our have been victims of efforts that we have undertaken to reach people in need. Secondly, I must say that uh, we are not satisfied, neither in Yemen, in Iraq, Syria, or in any other place, with the level of respect for international humanitarian law that present-day actors have. And we are frustrated in many places today with the politicization of humanitarian assistance. In taking, making humanitarian assistance conditional to political uh, behavior is unacceptable and, uh, and I think these are some of the concern which bother us today uh, far beyond Yemen in many of the conflicts, politicization of humanitarian assistance, uh, the fact that uh, we don't have access and security and safety for our workers. Before the last question, you are found in Africa today. I just want you to give me uh, a mental picture of your activities in Africa. Today you are in a continent where you have some of the hot spots in the world, the DRC, the Central African Republic. Today you are talking of Nigeria with increasing insurgency from Boko Haram, Cameroon, there are about hundreds and hundreds of refugees present now. What kind of assistance do you provide and just how worrisome is the situation in Africa today? Maybe our budget is the best reflect of where our worries are. 44% of what ICRC is doing worldwide is on the continent of Africa. Mm. So 32% 30, 30, is in the Middle East. So you see where our focus and our concern is. Which is your is. top 
country priority in Africa? In Africa, uh, at the present moment, its first priority is South Sudan. It's the second largest operation of ICRC worldwide. The third largest operation is now Lake Chad. It's our operation in combined Niger, Nigeria, uh, Cameroon and Chad. So these are number two and three. On ICRC scale, Syria is the largest budget uh, worldwide. So it shows you that uh, the concerns are big. And what is interesting, I mean, we are active on the continent of Africa in long-term protracted conflict. We have been for decades in the Democratic Republic of the Congo or in Somalia. And we have operations which we are scaling up considerably, like in this region here, or in the Sahel, or in Libya, uh, or in some other uh, of the hotspots uh, on the continent of Africa. Finally, a few months ago, I watched your director general was talking to the BBC, Mr. Dakor, about the difficulties involved in uh, providing humanitarian assistance in the world today. I equally saw the executive director of Save the Children, Krista Forsyth, complaining uh, the same issues you are complaining today, the politicization of humanitarian activity. 150 years after the celebration of the Red Cross movement, what is the future like? The founding father of the Red Cross movement thought that the ICRC would be superfluous after a couple of years and that countries will solve their social problems amongst themselves and within countries. 150 years later, I have to say that the mission remains as topical today as it was 150 years ago. Neutral, impartial and independent humanitarian system for those not participating in hostilities is still the big task to fulfill today and in, in the future. ICRC is committed to work on this, to scale up our operation as good as we can and to make a better life for so many who need it. The President of the International Committee for the Red Cross, Peter Mora, thanks very much for accepting our invitation on Global Watch. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. When you abuse that dignity, when you don't consider him, as a person who has feelings. I try as much as possible to ask whoever does that to take himself and put in the place of that other person. If someone were to say the same things of you as you have said of somebody else, what would be your reaction? What would be society's reaction? A group of uh, publishers came to the council once after we meted out a few sanctions on some professionals. And let me tell you that sanctions in this place are a last resort. Our basic principle is not to sanction people. It is more pedagogy rather than sanctioning or punishment. Now, they came. And when they had told their story, the question I asked one of them, and a very senior journalist, Mr. Junke, of the uh, Nouvelle Ex 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 Expression. Expression, and of, uh, what's the other one, his, his channel, his television, Equinox. I asked him, I said, sir, the journalist that you are, if Peter Isoka were to write something about you, he would appraise your performance. He will talk about what you have achieved in the profession to the extent that you have left from just ordinary writing to creating even a television channel. And that's praiseworthy. But if I should take away all of that credit from you and talk of Severin Junke, this person who cannot even walk well, and you start touching on a man's life, that precious element of his, I think something is, something is wrong somewhere, and that has to be checked. He agreed with me. And the protest became 
They said, well, grand friend, we are happy that you could give us this lesson. You, you, you just accepted that journalists have the entire freedom to write whatsoever they want to write. But you, Go ahead. Yeah, but you know that at times when journalists write, um, the hands of the law um, is very hard on them, on the same crimes that other people commit uh, 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 freely. I give you a categorical example. In this nation, there was a minister who came on the air and said um, one journalist died of HIV and AIDS against the ethics of the medical profession because you cannot declare the, the cause of the death of somebody without the family's approval that this person died of this disease. And he, was, he went unpunished. But when a journalist writes an article about, let's say, the health of the President of the Republic, he's simply hammered by the law. Why all these bias no, against the journalists? Law, the law, the law. The law has not yet hammered on those who wrote about the health of the President. I was on a program, I think, on one of our friendly channels, and they asked me a similar question, and especially about my own health. And uh, they asked whether they are wrong to tell people of my ill health. I told them why. I told them I was not feeling well. Consequently, they had a right to say it, that I was not feeling well. But when, for instance, the journalist you're referring to take an article that has been published by some other newspaper, a foreign newspaper, and they take it verbatim and put it for their public, since when did President Paul Bia tell them he was sick? Did they investigate to find out whether President Paul Bia was sick? There is a public figure, and a public figure does not have a private no. life. And one of, the funda one of the fundamental elements the Cameroonian public should have is that of knowing the health of their president, because as president, they own him. He does not own them because they brought him to power. Find out. When that information has not come out, do you speculate? Because speculation only puts you in difficulty. Because suppose it comes out that it is not true. You've published that, oh, the president of the republic is sick and dying. Because it was a question of a critical situation. Did you verify? There was a time there was an accident in, uh, in Abomba. And some newspapers come out and say, six died, ten died. They didn't go to the field to find out whether indeed ten or six people died. They have not succeeded at that because no one inch of Cameroonian territory has been compromised or has been ceded to Boko Haram or to anybody. So Boko Haram has failed in that. Why have they failed? because of the efficacy, because of the efficiency and the effectiveness of our defense and security policies. Secondly, all Cameroonians, including um, our brothers and sisters of the extreme north and, and from all the other regions, are 100% behind the security forces and behind the president. And so Boko Haram has discovered that Cameroonians in general and in their majority and our defense forces are so alert and are so ready that they are not capable of getting one inch of Cameroonian territory once in a while. And when you are dealing with um, a bush conflict, particularly a bush war, which is in a way what is called now an asymmetric war, that is to say a war between established forces or an established body and an unestablished uh, sort of organization, anomic organization, they have not been able to succeed apart from uh, uh, murdering some people here and there every once in a while, kidnapping some people here every once in a while, but they have not succeeded from the standpoint of warfare to achieve any of their purposes. And guess what? In fact, they are they they they, they are they 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 are they they, they are actually um, uh, receding.